Good to see you all here today. We've had a little bit of uh, technological difficulty this morning, but the Lord is still in control and his spirit is still moving among us. And I'm just sensing in the spirit that this is such a critical hour. That God is getting ready to do something and we've longed for this moment. I just sense that the Holy Spirit is saying that the great regathering is upon us. That the moment is drawing nigh and that we have patiently waited and we have sought his face and we have been faithful. But now the moment is drawing near and the great regathering is upon us. I wanna draw your attention, I'm just gonna jump into this because we've got a little bit of a journey today and uh, I'm trying to hold myself together uh, today because I, I feel his, his presence so strong, but I, I want to get into this word and I, I want to give it to you. So uh, this is uh, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. Holy Spirit, we just invite you. We need you. We call upon you, Lord. Holy Spirit, come, fill our hearts with your glory, with your presence. Lord, we submit to you today. We surrender to you today. Open our ears to hear your voice. Open our eyes to see your presence, O oh God. Lord, we need you today. God, breathe through these words today. Speak to the hearts of your people. Let them be words that bring life and not death, freedom and not bondage. Open our eyes, O oh God, to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Open our eyes to see things as they are. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you said that you would gather us even from the ends of the earth. And that this is the moment in which you are calling us and you are gathering us together to you. You are our God. We submit to you today. We worship you with all of our hearts and our hearts are filled with expectation. I will stand at my watch and see what the Lord my God will say. Wow. He promises peace to his children. Mm. Hallelujah. Mm. Lord, your presence is so wonderful. There is nothing like your presence, Lord. There is nothing like your presence, God. I pray that your presence would visit every one of your sons and daughters today, wherever they are. God, wherever they are, let the Holy Spirit come into every room and into every household and into every living room and into every bedroom, every place where the sound of this service would go. Let the Holy Spirit move upon your people today, God. Oh, my God, pour out your Spirit on your sons and daughters today, God, on every soul, every soul that is lifted up to you today, God. Let your presence come, God. Let your presence come. Lord, break through today, God. 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 We need an altar call today, God. We need an altar call today, God. We need to come to the altar and seek your face, God. We need to be touched by you today, God. We need to be touched by you, God. We need a touch from the Master's hand today, God. And so we seek your face. We seek you with all of our hearts, O oh God. We incline our ears unto you, O oh God. We listen for your voice, God. We listen for your voice. Hallelujah. 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 We worship you today. In Jesus' mighty name. <clears throat> Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mitzpah and Shin and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. Can somebody get me a tissue or a paper towel or something, please? Thank you. <clears throat> Gracias. Now i got pieces of tissue all over my face, probably. Yeah. Okay, praise the Lord. <clears throat> Are we okay? Okay. 
All right. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, we're good. All right, we're okay. The book of 1 Samuel starts with a barren woman who was loved. Her name was Hannah. Her husband's name was Elkanah. She was barren. She could not conceive, but she was loved. And she began to cry out to God in her barrenness, and God responded to her barrenness by giving her a son. And the whole story of the book of 1 Samuel is set in motion as this woman, who was barren but loved, cries out to the Lord, her womb is open, and she conceives a son, and she gives God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. A sacrifice of thanksgiving. And that sacrifice of thanksgiving... God turned into a prophet. So the prophetic is always born out of sacrifice. And sacrifice is always born, right? Sacrifice is always born out of thanksgiving. And thanksgiving always comes from an experience of barrenness in which something that you have attempted fails. Something that you have desired does not come into be. Whenever we walk through situations of barrenness in our lives in which it seems that our plans come to nothing, That is simply God positioning us for a miracle. Because many of us, we cry out for miracles, but we don't want God to put us in any situation in which we need one. As soon as we're put in a situation in which we need a miracle, we begin to feel abandoned by God. But God says, how can I give you a miracle if you don't let me put you in a situation in which you need one? You see, if you're put in a situation in which you need a miracle, that is God's gift to you. God is setting you up for thanksgiving. And when God sets you up for thanksgiving, he sets you up for sacrifice. And so Hannah gives birth to a child. The desire of her heart comes to be. And the first thing she does in response to the blessing is make a sacrifice of thanksgiving to God. She says, I'm going to give God the fruit of my womb. I'm going to give him my firstborn son. Yeah. And that sacrifice, that which was given to God as a sacrifice, yeah. God says, I'm going to speak through that. Wow. Because at the end of the day, God can only speak through your sacrifice. Yeah. Wow. The prophetic is always the fruit of sacrifice. Mm. Had this woman not made this sacrifice to God, Israel would have been left without a prophet mm. in the midst of one of its greatest moments of crisis. In fact, the nation of Israel might have ceased to be had there not been a prophet at this critical time. You see, Samuel was born during a time in which Israel was in trouble but didn't know it. Israel was in trouble but didn't know it. And the worst place you can be is in trouble but not know you're in trouble. They were in trouble for two reasons. Number one, 1 Samuel chapter 3 tells us that the word of the Lord was rare. Nobody was hearing from God. You're always in trouble when you're in a situation when neither you nor the people around you can hear from God. You see, we're never in trouble if we're hearing from God. Even if there's trouble all around us, as long as we can hear from God, we're okay. We can walk through the worst types of situations, but we're hearing from God, so we're okay. But when the word of the Lord becomes rare and neither you nor anyone around you is hearing from God, there's no word from God, you're in trouble. And the biggest problem in Israel was that they were not hearing from God, and everyone was okay with that. Nobody was crying. Nobody was worried about that. Nobody was lamenting and crying, and there was no sackcloth and ashes. There was nobody going, God's not speaking to us. Something is wrong. Now you know you're in trouble because you're so deep in the deep that you don't even know how to cry out of the deep. Second problem was that there was sin in the camp. Nobody was hearing from God, and there was sin in the camp. Meaning that they were taking God's presence for granted. That's all sin is, is a taking for granted of the presence of God. He's always going to be there. Actually, sin is a failure to connect with the fact that God is always, always, always with us. You know, I, I, talk, I asked somebody one time, I said, would you do what you just confessed that you did to me, uh, that you did? Would you do that if I was sitting in the room with you? He says, no, never. I said, but you would do it with God sitting in the room with you? That is, you simply don't believe that God is with you all the time. You say you believe it, but you don't believe it. Because if you you and I truly believed that God was with us and that he never left us, there'd be all kinds of stuff that we could never do because we would be constantly aware of the presence of God. So there was a loss of awareness of his presence. There was a complete loss of his word. But there was form. They had the Ark of the Covenant. They had the tabernacle. 
They were going in and making sacrifices. They had the, the tabernacle of Moses. They had the outer court, the inner court, the Holy of Holies. And inside the Holy of Holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant. So the form was there. They had a form of godliness, but it was devoid of power. But they were okay with the form. They were okay with going to church every Sunday, even though there was no godliness in their life. They were okay with going through the religious mo motions, even though there was no holiness, even though there was no presence, even though there was no word from God. They thought they were okay because the form was still intact. Because I still go to the Sunday morning service, and I'm still a part of a community group, and I'm serving a ministry. I've got all the form, but there's no content. And so Israel was in trouble because they had a form of godliness, but there was no power. There was no presence. And there was no righteousness. And there was no holiness. Israel was in trouble, but God had already responded to the trouble of Israel by giving this woman, Hannah, a son, putting it in her heart to make that son a sacrifice. Wow. And God says, now I've got a prophet. Now that I've got a sacrifice, I've got a mouthpiece. Now that I've got a sacrifice, I've got a voice that I can speak to. And this prophet was growing up in Israel, even though everything around him was wicked and unrighteous, God said, I've got a prophet. Yeah. But when Samuel was still young, Israel went into warfare against the Philistines as the result of their disconnection from the presence and the word of God. And they're being beaten in battle by the Philistines, and what they do is they run into the Holy of Holies, they grab the Ark of the Covenant, they carry it out on the battlefield, and they give a shout. And the, the Philistines are scared because they're, they're like, this is the God that brought them out of Egypt that parted the Red Sea for them. We can't stand against this God. But the Philistines beat them up one side of the battlefield and down the other and then stole the Ark of the Covenant from them at the end of that battle. Yeah. The result of the fact that nobody was hearing from God and there was sin in the camp, the result of the fact was complete loss of the presence. Meaning they not only lost the word of God and the presence of God, they even lost the form. Because now the tabernacle without the Ark of the Covenant is nothing. Now even the tent collapses. Now everything collapses. They've lost the form. You know what happens when you live long enough without the power of God, without the presence of God, without the voice of God, when you live long enough in unconfessed sin and, and willing rebellion against God, is you even lose the form. You even lose the, suddenly you can't even go to the Sunday morning service anymore. You can't even go to the community group anymore. You, you're, you lose the form. The form collapses when all of a sudden the ark of God is stolen from you in some battle, some warfare that you enter into when you try to fall back on the presence of God and it's not there because you haven't been walking with him. Wow. And so the form collapses. Wow. But the prophet is still there. God's response, God saw that this was coming, but God had already responded and they didn't know it. You see, God has prophets in your life that you don't even know are there. They're, even right now, we see what's happening in America and it feels like evangelical Christianity has collapsed around us. We've lost our witness. Our witness has been incinerated. It seems that the ark has departed. I Ichabod, the glory has departed, but, but God has already responded. And you know when I see God's response is when I look and see these little children running around. There's prophet Samuel's growing up around us and we don't even know that God has already set them aside and put his mark on their lives and determined that he's going to speak to Israel again one day. Wow. And here's the crazy thing. The Philistines steal the Ark of the Covenant and they try to put him in the, in the temple with their god, Dagon. And they wake up the next morning and Dagon is bowing before the Ark of God. They set Dagon back on his, his, in his place. They go to sleep, come back the next morning and Dagon's not only bowing, but his arms are cut off. The, the thing that they discovered was that God was very able to defend himself. You see, the thing is that God was never in trouble. Israel was in trouble. Can I say that God is not, the Christ is not in trouble in America. Christianity is in trouble. <laughs> Christ is not in trouble. God can defend himself. Say, oh, this is doing, giving God a bad name. No, no, no. You can't give God a bad name, but you can give Christians a bad name, <laughs> right? God is never in trouble. God is able to defend himself. God, the kingdom of God will continue to expand. God's going to do his thing with or without us. He's never had a bad day. Never woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Nobody puts rusty nails in his granola. Yeah. That's right. And so the Ark of the Covenant is with the Philistines for seven months. The people of Israel are thinking, we've lost the presence forever. How many know that the presence always makes its way back to the people of God? The question is, are the people of God going to be ready for the presence when the presence returns? 
You see, if you've experienced the loss of the presence of God in your life, this is a season in which you must be preparing yourself for the return of the presence. Because God loves his children so much that he never abandons us forever. He never casts us off forever. God has already prepared the moment for the return of the presence. The question is, will your heart be ready for the return of the presence when the presence comes? And the problem was Israel was not ready. Seven months later, the Philistines said, we need to get rid of this thing because God is judging us. We can't stand, we can't have this God among us. And they sent him, they sent the Ark of the Covenant from city to city to city. Finally, they sent it back to Beth Shemesh and the the people of Israel there in Beth Shemesh, they were gathering in their wheat harvest and they see the Ark of the Covenant coming over the hill, being pulled on a cart and they run. They're not ready for the presence. They don't know how to handle the presence. They run and, and pull the lid off the Ark and look inside. And the judgment of God falls and, and people start dying everywhere. Wow. So then they call the people up in kiriath Jerim. They're like, you guys need to send some priests down to get this thing because we don't know what to do with it. We can't handle it. The presence of God is too hot for us to handle and too cold for us to hold. Yeah. And so the people of, of kiriath Jerim, they grab their priest Abinadab. He comes down. He's reading the book. He, yeah. he learns from the book how to handle the presence of God because you don't just treat God with contempt. You, don't just, you, you can't become over-familiar with him. Uh, hey, my homie, my dog, God is my dog. He's my homie. Yeah. You know, I even heard somebody said she calls God the N-word. That's my N right there. No, 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 no. He's not your homie. He's not your dog. He's not your road dog. He's not your buddy. He is Lord. He is King. He is Savior. He is holy. He says, by those who approach me, I must be regarded as holy. And so if you want to handle the presence, you've got to learn it from the book. And by the way, the book is always better than the movie anyway. You see, some of us want, we always, you only want the movie. You want God to show up in the movie of your life. Let me tell you something, the book is better than the movie. You need to get in the book because there's details in the book that you're not going to find in the movie. That's another sermon. So Abinadab comes down, takes the Ark of the Covenant, consecrates his sons as priests, and puts it up in his house. And now for 20 years, the presence of God is, the, is, is really the sole possession of one family. One family. Everyone else is living outside the presence, but there's one house church, one home group, one community group that's experiencing the presence of God. But the prophet is still growing. And when Samuel comes to maturity, after the ark has been in the home of Abinadab for 20 years in kiriath Jerim, the prophetic is born in the heart of Samuel. And Samuel says, it's time. And this is what he says here in 1 Samuel chapter 7. He says, gather all of Israel back to Mitzpah. He sends out a message to all of Israel and says, meet me in Mitzpah. Are you ready to return to the Lord? He sensed that the hearts of Israel were ready. He sensed that people's hearts were open. He sensed that there was a brokenness of heart and a readiness to repent. How many, listen, I talked to a lifeguard and he said when he sees someone drowning, he does not immediately jump in to save them. He waits until they stop kicking, until they're ready to surrender, and until they're ready to stop doing it on their own. And when they've lost their strength, then he jumps in and saves them. He says, if I jump in to save someone who is still kicking, they're going to kick me, they're going to drag me down and we're both going to drown. But if I wait till they're done with their strength where they're ready to stop living by their strength and they're ready now to release and surrender to my strength now I can save you you see God waits while we're still living in the flesh he says I'm waiting until you're ready to live that kingdom first life that kingdom first life that is not by might not by power but by my spirit where you're ready to quit kicking at after 20 years Israel had finally run out of strength and they were ready to surrender to God they were ready to stop kicking and Samuel says now it's time but here's what we're going to do. Here is the restoration of God. Let's meet at Mitzpah. It's time to assemble. It's time for the great regathering. It's time to bring us all back together again. But he picked a particular place for that regathering. He says, we're going to meet at Mitzpah. We're going to Mitzpah. Get everybody together and tell them, meet Samuel at Mitzpah. It was already known that Samuel was a prophet in Israel, but Samuel says, I'm I'm, I'm not going city to city anymore. I'm not getting on Zoom anymore. Now we're going to have a gathering. This is not going to be a live stream event anymore. Now 
now it's time for a gathering. You see, when it's time for God's redemption to break forth, he calls a gathering. And I'm telling you by the word of the Lord that God is calling us back to mitzvah, that God is getting ready to gather us back together again, that what he's doing is bigger than Zoom. What he's doing is bigger than an online service. God is calling a gathering because it's time for him to break through on behalf of his people. And so Samuel calls a gathering at mitzvah. But the question is, what is mitzvah? You see, the word mitzvah literally means watch. And what, what, what you would have found if you went to the place called mitzvah, which was in the mountains of Gilead, was a heap of stones. And if you came to that heap of stones, that monument, and you asked one of the children of Israel, what is this heap of stones? What does this monument mean? They would tell you a story that you can actually find in Genesis chapter 31 of a young man named Jacob who had stolen his brother's birthright and blessing and ran for his life to be in Haran with his uncle Laban. And he was there for 20 years, acquired two wives and a bunch of concubines and had a bunch of children. And at a certain point, God spoke to him and said, go back home now. Go back to the land of your father Abraham and your father Isaac. It's now time for you to go back and possess your inheritance. And and so he takes his wives, his concubines, his children, his flocks, his herds, and his servants, and they leave Laban's house, but they leave without telling Laban, his wife's father, that he was leaving. Three days go by, Laban finds out, and Laban gathers his, his, his squad, and they go off in search. And Laban's thinking he's going to do some harm to Jacob. Seven days later, Laban overtakes him in the mountains of Gilead. But that night, the night before they met, God appears to Laban in a dream says, don't you dare lay a hand on Jacob. And you don't, don't you even say a word to him, neither good nor evil. You just be careful. I'm watching you, Laban. If you put a hand on Jacob, you, you're going to deal with me. And then Laban wakes up the next morning with fear of God. I better be careful how I talk to Jacob because God is watching me. And he and Jacob have this interaction there in the middle of Genesis 31. And at the end of that interaction, it becomes apparent to Jacob that God is watching over him, that God has helped him, that God has provided for him, that God has brought him to where he is. And and he sets up a stone. And then he says to all of his brethren, gather stones. And this gathering of stones This assembly of stones transpires. This congregation of stones transpires. And they begin to fit those stones together into a monument, into a pillar. And they name that pillar, that monument, mitzpah, which means watch. It was a monument to the fact that God has been watching over us. It's a monument, a memorial to the truth. It's a testimony to the truth that God has watched over us, that if it had not been for the Lord on our side, where would we be? And it became a monument not just for Jacob, but for all of Israel, that anyone passing through the mountains of Gilead would see that monument and remember, had it not been for God watching over my father Jacob, I would not be here. Had it not been for God providing for my father Jacob, I would not be. Where would we be had it not been for the Lord on our side? And Samuel says, gather all of Israel to mitzvah. We're going to go back to the place where God made it known that he was watching over us. We're going to go back to the place where God showed us that he was protecting us. We're going to go back to the place where it became known to us that God was with us, that he is on our side, that there was no weapon forged against us that could ever prosper. And there, that because God is on our side, because he who watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. Yeah. Come back to mitzpah. Come back to mitzpah. Church, do you know what our mitzpah was? Our mitzpah was Emeryville. Emeryville was the place where God showed us that he was watching over us. Emeryville was the place where God showed us that he was leading us on this journey. Emeryville was the place where God showed us that we were his idea and not our own idea. Because there were so many circumstances and situations that should have destroyed us as a church. But it it couldn't destroy us. Why? Because of mitzvah. Because of the God who was watching over us. It was just a monument. It was not our inheritance, but it was a monument. 
It was not our destiny, but it was a monument. It was a, and it will always be for us our mitzvah, our place of remembrance of how God brought us forth, of how God protected us, of how God carried us on eagle's wings. God knew that we would branch out to San Francisco, but Emeryville was just a monument. God knows that there's even more campuses in the future and, and more homes and more places, and God knew that he would even send us to El Cerrito, but Emeryville was just a monument, a memorial, our mitzvah. And Samuel says, God's going to do something. He's going to restore his presence to us, but first, all Israel has to gather at Mitzpah. Wow. And all of Israel gathers there at Mitzpah. Mm. And Samuel says to all of Israel, are you ready now? Wow. Are you ready to return to the Lord? Wow. Are you ready to repent of your sins? Are you ready to get right with God? Are you ready to get serious about walking with Him? And Israel begins to weep and mourn, and they begin to lament, and they cry out, we have sinned against God. And they begin to weep and mourn. They put on, they, it says they poured out water, and they fasted, and they put on sackcloth, and they begin to mourn and weep before the Lord, and they begin to confess their sins publicly. That's a work of the Spirit of God. And then Samuel begins to pray for Israel. But when the lords of the Philistines hear that Israel was gathered at Mitzpah, the scripture says the Philistines came up against them to make war. This is the critical moment. Because you're gathered at Mitzpah to seek the Lord. But the moment you turn your heart to seek the Lord in any situation in your life, at that very moment, the enemy will always come against you. Wow. There will always be some type of trouble that comes the moment you seek the Lord. And this is why, this is, the distract, this is the strategy of the enemy, is to distract you at the moment of your pursuit of God. Wow. To pull you out of the presence. Wow. To turn your attention away from the spirit and back to the flesh. Wow. And in that moment where the enemy attacks you at your mitzvah, his only strategy is to get you to turn your heart away from the Lord and start making plans in the flesh wow. to figure out what am I going to do. And what does Israel do in that moment? They turn to Samuel and they cry out, don't stop crying out to the Lord for us. They pray first. You know, we talk so much about the kingdom first life. Do you realize that the kingdom first life is first and foremost the prayer first life? Wow. It means that when you hit trouble, you pray first. Yeah. That your knee-jerk reaction, most of us, we get pulled out of the prayer closet and into problem-solving mode. Here's what I'm going to do. No, no, no. You pray first. Israel said, yes, we've got swords waiting over here, but we're not going to first grab our swords and go to war. We're going to pray first. Yes, we've got shields and armor, but we're not grabbing our armor and shields first. We're going to pray first. Yes, we've got some tacticians among us, and we've got some generals who can line us up and, and put us into order, but we're going to pray first. Yes, we might even have a few dollars in the bank that we might be able to throw at this, but we're not turning to the dollars first. We're going to pray first. We're not Googling first. We're going to pray first. We're not going to a conference first. We're going to pray first. We're not calling for counsel first. We're going to pray first. The kingdom first life is first and foremost the prayer first life. And matter of fact, didn't Jesus to teach us, he said, when Jesus taught us the Lord's prayer, he said, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy kingdom come, thy will be. Do you realize that the only access we have to the kingdom of God is through prayer? Wow. Most of us never even get into the kingdom because we don't pray. We don't spend any time on our knees. You've got no access to the kingdom first life wow. apart from prayer. Wow. Oh. And so the people cry out, Samuel, don't stop praying. Samuel, don't stop praying. Come on, folks, we got to pray. The enemy's coming against us. What's our response? we got to pray. It's time to pray. We've got to be a praying church now. If we've ever been, been a praying church before, it's time for us to be a praying church right now. And Samuel takes a lamb and in the presence of the people offers to God a sacrifice while the entire assembly is crying out to God. And the scripture says that God thundered against the Philistines and confused them. And then the Israelites grabbed their swords and their spears and their shields and their armor and went in pursuit of the Philistines and destroyed them. And not only did they destroy that particular attack, 
But they recovered everything that the Philistines had taken from them in all of those years of rebellion against God. Everything that they lost because of their decades of rebellion was restored to them because of their moment of surrender. Wow. You know how we talk about it takes 20 years to build this, but one moment to destroy it? Yeah. This was the opposite. Wow. It took them 20 years to lose all of this favor and blessing from God, wow. but one moment of surrender and repentance wow. to restore it. God's economy is completely different. Yeah. It's, for some of you, it's taken you decades to destroy your life to the place where you're at right now. Wow. But God can restore it in a moment. Amen. That's the power of our God. Yes. Come on, somebody. Yes. Amen. So good. And then, when the victory had been secured, yeah. after the sacrifice had been made, mm. and the prayers were offered, Samuel looks at Mitzpah, that pile of stones that Jacob built. And he says in his heart, he hears the Holy Spirit say, it's time for us to go up a little bit higher. And he says to the assembly, follow me. They're in the mountains of Gilead. And the top of the mountain is called Shin, which means peak. And halfway down the mountain is Mitzpah, where, where Jacob's memorial was. Samuel leads them halfway between Mitzpah and Shin. Between the last memorial of what God did before and the top of the mountain where God is eventually going to take us. And he said, we're building a new memorial here. And he builds a memorial, another heap of stones. Come on, gather these stones, pile them up. And he calls it Ebenezer, which means Rock of help. Wow. We're not at the last place anymore, but we're not at the final place either. We're between Mitzpah and Shin, but it's time for us to build our Ebenezer. Wow. At that moment where God rescued them from disaster, at that moment where God rooted the enemy, at that moment where God reestablished his watch, reestablished his provision, reestablished his protection, and reestablished his help, Samuel says, we're going to build a memorial right here. And we're going to call it Ebenezer, rock of help. This is the word of the Lord. That this place where we are right now standing and streaming to you from here in the city of El Cerrito, this is our Ebenezer. Wow. And this is the moment in which God is calling us to build our Ebenezer. And Samuel could not build it on his own. He put the first stone in place, but then he says to his brethren, go gather stones. Go get your stones and bring them. We're building our Ebenezer. This is going to be our rock of help. We're going to remember this moment that God took us beyond mitzvah, that God took us beyond the help that he had given us before, took us beyond last year's breakthrough, took us beyond last year's miracle, took us beyond last decade's provision. He took us to a new place, and it's higher than the last place. And we'll always remember mitzvah and be thankful for it. But now it's time for us to build our Ebenezer. And this is the moment in which we are standing right now, in which God is calling us to build, to finish building. And I'm telling you, the first stones have been set in place. And last year, when we did Commitment Sunday, on that second Sunday in March, and everyone came to the altar making their pledges, and I saw the tears in eyes. Do you know what, we st we, what happened? Everyone was bringing their stone to put in place. And all the stones are gathering, but there's some missing stones. And there's some more stones that need to come into place. But I'm telling you that God is calling us to finish building our Ebenezer. And this is our Ebenezer. This is the place where God has established His provision Amen. for us. Amen. This is our rock of help. And now that that rock of help had been established and Israel's hearts had been turned back to God, the land was restored. The Ark of the Covenant was brought back to its place in the tabernacle. The worship of the Lord was restored. And there was peace in Israel. And I believe that God is bringing us into a season and into a time in which there will be peace across the land. Because Ebenezer has been established. Mm. This is the work to which God has called us. Amen. And this is the time Amen. for us to bring it yeah. to completion. Mm. Let's pray. And as we pray, I'm going to invite my wife to come. 
precious Heavenly Father, we thank you today that you are our help. You have helped us. You have watched over us. Yes, God. You have protected us. Mm. And you have been our provision. Jesus, 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 Jesus. You have put it in our hearts to build this rock of help. This Ebenezer in this city. And I thank you that even now you're tugging on the hearts of your people. This work has begun and we will fulfill it because it is the ministry that you've given to us. Holy Spirit, I pray for encouragement to come to every heart and every soul of every son and every daughter under the sound of my voice. And that those whose hearts you have stirred would gather their stones and bring them and set them on the pile that this memorial might be built for your glory mm. and your glory alone. Amen. I pray it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 I don't know about you, but I feel the, the stirring and the rumbling mm. under what we cannot see. You know, just looking back past few weeks, so many things have happened. People have broken in and stolen things, right? For this get, building. Yeah, for this building, right? And, and even just this week, people have broken in, mm -hmm. right? And then even in the lives of our people, a different sickness and, and different stuff. You know, it's like, you know, like so many like distractions of the enemy to kind of take our focus away. The enemy wants us to be anxious. The enemy wants us to worry. The enemy wants us to feel like we're lost. The enemy wants us to feel like, like we lost the grip. We lost the control. But you know what? I feel the opposite. When we are attacked more than normal, when people have broken into our building more than once, twice and three times now when there's a, a, a demonic right distraction that is trying to pull our faith away you know what i'm more excited i am so excited family church it's time for us to refocus re our line and we're gonna join god in what he is doing we will not be distracted we will not walk in discouragement but you know what? We're going to lift our eyes and we're going to walk with excitement and expectancy. Right. right? Last night when we did our fam uh, family Bible reading, it talked about living with excitement yeah. because he is our father and we are his children. It is like waking up to God, what's next? Right. Family, let's get excited. God, what is next? Yes. What's the next inheritance that you're going to release and manifest upon our church, upon our lives? So will you join with me yes. one more time in prayer? Yes. Staff, will you just stand up? Let's arise in faith right now. And you know, like even like even last Sunday, right? Our our live streams got like dis disrupted, and even today, and it almost al almost, but it didn't. It almost shook us a little bit with anxiety. It almost shook us and questioned what is going on. But you know what? You know we will not be distracted. We're gonna rise up in faith, and we're 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 not going to question. God, are we going to lose this God? No, we're not going to question God. We're not going to question, right? His authority over our lives. But we're going to ask him a different question. God, what are you about to do? What are you about to do, God? You know what we believe? We need a miracle for our building project. We need a miracle in the lives of our people. We believe for supernatural miracles. We believe for healing. Those of you that have been struggling even physically with vertigo, with, with stomach problems, you know what? Even arthritis, you know what? We're going to believe for supernatural movement yes, of God. Right, so right, wherever right. you are in your home, rise up right now. Yes. 
stand up right now. Lift your hands to God right now and say, God, what are you up to right now? What are you about to do among us? Do not look to demonic powers and, and be a friend. What are they doing? What's going to happen? No. Look to God today. God, what are you about to do? What miracles are you about to release, God, as we gather to build up our Ebenezer, God? We're going to refocus, refresh our faith. What are you about to do? Release healing among us, God. Release breakthrough among us, God. Release faith among us, God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Too excited. Amen. 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 Jesus. 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 Amen. God is good. Yes, he is. I'm so excited. We could go on and on and on, can't we? We sure could. Wow. You know what? Why don't we, if you would be willing to join with me. I feel like, I know we've been fasting and praying, you know, the people, uh, people choosing like breakfast to fast or lunch to fast. I just feel like next few days, we need to fast, up our fasting. You know, I've been fasting every Monday, right, for lunch, for, as, for our fasting and prayer. I just feel like next three days we need to fast. Wednesday night, we have our monthly Wednesday night prayer gathering, right? We're gonna, do, we're gonna be here, right? I mean, you will join us on... on same way you're joining us. Now. Yeah, right now online, but some of us will be here at church. And let's fast until Wednesday night prayer. And I believe God's going to do miracles among us. That's right. The, I mean, you're going to have, you You can't help but say that is the finger of God. That's right. That, that is God. Yep. We're going to believe for supernatural miracles among us. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's good. All right. I'm going to pray one more time and just end it. Okay. All right. All right. Join with me. Lift your hands. Holy Spirit, we thank you. Lift our hearts. Lift our gaze from the distractions of the enemy. God, strengthen the faith of your sons and daughters in this season. Father, as we seek your face with fasting and prayer in this season, next few days we ask lord that you will realign our hearts and our minds and even our days to your kingdom let your kingdom come let your will be done here at lineage church we ask in jesus name we pray amen amen God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. We love you so much from, all, from the depths of our hearts. Have a wonderful week.